everybody. Thanks for coming on again tonight. We're going to have a great time in the Bible, and I'm excited for this lesson. It's entitled, When Sin Had Come to Its Fullness. And we're going to go to an Old Testament prophecy where Abraham was given words from God when he went into a vision. And it just shows you how what God was saying to Abraham about Israel being bound in Egypt, where they're bound about 430 years, and they came out and God was going to bring them out of captivity from Egypt at a very important time, very strategic time in the plan of God. And it overlaps, it parallels with what Jesus was talking about in his day when he came at a very strategic time as well. And it all had to do with conquering the work of the devil. Watch how this fits together with this Old Testament story of Israel and how it foreshadows what happened in the New Testament when Jesus came. And so, again, this is entitled, When Sin Had Come to Its Fullness. And I'm going to show you how the destruction of Jerusalem was key. It was pivotal in God's overall wrath and judgment. Now, Abraham, as you know, was called the father of the faithful, not just to Israel only. And in other words, not just to the circumcised. The Bible calls Israel the circumcision and but also to the uncircumcision. And in Genesis chapter 14, Abraham fought a battle against four kings armies. Now you think of it. Remember Gideon only had 300 and he came against a big nation of uh, a national army of the of the Midianites? Well, God was with him, wasn't? It? In fact, God wanted Gideon to just have a few 300 because at before that he had thousands. He had multiple thousands. And God said it's too much because you're going to attribute the glory to yourself if I allow you to win. So I want this to be beyond the shadow of a doubt, my power upon your life that shows the world you had to have me for you to win this battle. And these four armies were fought because his nephew Lot had been taken captive and he was in Sodom and, and Sodom was captured when these four kings captured that whole region and and when you go to Genesis 14, verse 11 and 12, it says they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their victuals and went their way. In verse 12, they took Lot, Abram's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom and his goods and departed. So here he is captured. And Abraham actually defeats these armies from four nations. And then after this happens in Genesis 14 and 18, Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. So he comes and visits Abraham, and he blesses him. And what's interesting is Jesus is even compared to Melchizedek in the book of Hebrews in the New Testament. Melchizedek was a king and a priest at the same time. And he blesses Abraham with bread and wine. Now, when you study your Bible and you read Old Testament stories like this and you see Melchizedek, he's a king and he was also a priest according to Genesis 14 and 18. Well, Jesus is a king and a priest, right? You, you're supposed to know what the Old Testament teaches and keep that in mind when you read these Old Testament pictures and you will have your eyes opened up and you'll see foreshadows and messages that God's trying to tell us about Jesus and the church through these Old Testament stories. And not only was Melchizedek a king and priest like Jesus, Abraham was blessed by Melchizedek with bread and wine. Now, what does bread and wine tell you about? Remember the communion supper, the last supper of Jesus? He took the bread and broke it, said that represents his body. He took the wine and poured it, that represents his blood that shed and so this king, Melchizedek, was from Salem, the Bible says. That same city was known as Jerush Jerusalem. Salem means peace, shalom, Jerusalem. And so here we've got Jerusalem. 
Here you've got a king and priest in the form of Melchizedek. And you've got bread and wine being used to bless. So many of these foreshadows are associated with Jesus. Now, bread and wine, because they were at the Last Supper with Jesus Christ and his disciples, every time we read of it, it should always remind us of the truth of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. Because by breaking that bread at the Last Supper, Jesus was representing his body being killed. The bread represents his body. And the wine being poured represents his blood being shed. And I've noticed all through the Old Testament, in fact, there's another Exodus story where these people were masquerading as those from another nation, as if they were from far away, and they didn't want Israel to conquer them. So they tried deceiving Israel, and they had moldy bread and old wine bottles, bread and wine. And there's a message of the cross there. But that pouring out of the wine and the breaking of the bread, it was indicating the truth of his body's death and his shed blood that would save their souls. And you could say that our daily bread, remember we pray, give us this day our daily bread in the Lord's Prayer, it's feeding on truth of the cross. Because bread and wine representing his body being killed and his blood being shed, is so necessary for our salvation. We needed a sacrifice, and Jesus was that sacrifice. And it would take our sins and save us. He took our sins upon himself, and he experienced the death penalty that our, sin, our sins demanded we pay one day. But he said, I'll pay it for you. So all of that concept is understood spiritually when you see a picture of the bread and wine. Are, are you grasping what I'm trying to say? And so these truths of the cross, which the daily bread, the bread and the wine represents, it's, it's called bread or food because just like your body needs nutrition and, and food nurtures your body and feeds it, our souls also need food and truth is the food that our souls need to feed upon and more, more technically our spirits that can cause us to grow spiritually. Just like a physical person can't grow without good food, we can't grow spiritually without good truth. Now, Abraham, he was blessed with that bread and wine, and then he was promised by God. It's no coincidence that after he was blessed with bread and wine in Genesis 14, that Genesis 15 has Abraham receiving a promise that he's going to have innumerable children. And these children would result from, if you see the picture, a resurrection of Abraham. See, look in Genesis 15, verse 3 to 4. Abraham said, Behold, to me, he's talking to God, thou hast given no seed. And lo, one born in my house is my heir. In other words, God, why can't I use him? Remember when Hagar was the servant of Sarah? And Sarah couldn't have a child, so she said her servant would have a child for her from Abraham. Well, by the same token, Abraham didn't have a son of his own, so a, an heir could be made out of one of his servants, a man that was born in his house. That's the way the old culture worked back then. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, just like God told him about Sarah and Hagar that Hagar is not going to bear your child. But he that shall come from out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. Now, the reason Abraham was asking God, can't I make an heir from this servant in my house? Was because he was too old to father children. Physically, it would have been impossible for him to be a father again. But God's a God of miracles. And the one that comes forth out of your own bowels is going to be your heir, Abraham. And God actually caused a resurrection of his reproductive system in order for him to be a father again. See the picture of reproduction and resurrection? Therefore, the children of Israel would come from an actual resurrection, so to speak. And isn't that a powerful message, how that the resurrection of Jesus was going to cause many children to be born in the kingdom, who would be the children of Abraham, because Abraham was a father of the faithful. 
And this was all after he was given bread and wine. He experienced a kind of resurrection. Wonderful, isn't it? And you know, that's true for us today. We receive the truth of salvation, which I said the bread and the wine represents. Just like when you look at a cross and you think of that was the sacrifice that Jesus made dying on a cross to save our sins. Well, the bread and the wine sends forth a similar message. And when you eat that bread and drink that wine, that means you're learning the truth. Like if, if you're learning right now truth, you're feeding on bread and wine spiritually. And that bread and wine is a message of the death, the burial, and the resurrection. And we are crucified, buried, and resurrected with Jesus to walk in newness of life in a spiritual sense. And Romans chapter 6 has verse 3 telling the Roman Christians, Paul said, don't you people know that when you got baptized into Jesus, you were baptized into his death? And that made his death count as yours so that when he was buried and resurrected, you could say you were buried with him and you were resurrected with him so you'd resurrect out of a life of sin. So see all of this tying together with Abraham getting this bread and wine and then he experiences a resurrection where he physically can have children again. And it's children resulting from resurrection. That's like Christians. We are children who resulted from the resurrection of Jesus. If Jesus would have died on the cross and if they would have buried him and he stayed in the tomb and he never resurrected, we'd never be saved. Death wouldn't have been conquered. You see, he conquered death and we became recipients of death ever since Adam disobeyed God because God said, Adam, when you eat of that fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, you're going to die. And when Adam did eat the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, he sinned, disobedience to God is sin. And God said, now you're going to return to the dust from where you were taken, Adam. God took that dust and made Adam and he was going to return to it. God never planned for mankind to ever die. But now we all die because sin that Adam threw into the world brought death. His sin opened the door for death to come. So Jesus says, I'm going to conquer that death. I'm going to die, but I'm going to be without sin when I die. And when I die, a sinless man is going to rise again from the dead by the glory of God. And I am going to conquer death. If death was going to be defeated, Jesus had to fight death and let death kill him. Let death give, de give him all it had. Death. And then after Jesus is dead, then when he resurrects, he conquers it. He couldn't fight death without actually dying and resurrecting from it in order to defeat death. He had to die. So he conquered death. Now, in verse 7 of Genesis 15, God tells Abraham, I am the Lord that brought thee out of the Ur of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit. So the land where Israel now is situated in the earth was given to him, Abraham, and his seed. But God said, uh, you're in the land right now, Abraham. This is when he had fought the four kings and when Melchizedek had blessed him. He said, I'm giving you this land, but I'm not giving it to you just yet. You're here, but I'm not giving it to you yet. Now watch this. In the fourth generation, according to verse 16, they shall come hither again, talking about his descendants. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. Now, you just think about this for a moment. I just want to throw this in there. Abraham was just told he's going to have kids when he's physically too old to have them. And, and God just speaks as though it's a casual thing. It's no big deal. You're going to have kings. You're going to have kids, rather. And in the fourth generation of your descendants... They're going to come in here and take the land. And you don't even have kids yet. And God's telling you about four generations after you. <laughs> you can count on God. And he talks as though it's just the way it is. And you need to believe that. And so, not yet. You're not, your people's not going to get the land yet. They're going to come in the fourth generation because the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. Now, in other words, God waited for those people who lived in that land, their iniquity, 
to mature and get ripe because God not only wanted to give the land to Abraham's people, he wanted to destroy sin at the same time and he was waiting for that sin to get to the right level and then he would bring the people of God in there. Did you ever know that's why he waited four generations? He could have gave it to Abraham then, but he said, nope, your children are going to get it. You've had faith for me that I'm going to give you children. Well, I'm blessing you. And, and your children are going to be the ones that take this land. Now, for God to say that, that means he saw the people in Canaan as wicked people, the promised land people. And he didn't want Abraham's people to inherit the land until a degree of wickedness rose to a certain level where God just wouldn't tolerate it anymore. God's patient. God is patient. And he saw into the future, he sees the end from the beginning, and he saw that that level would rise to a point, then he would judge it. And he showed Abram that when that point arrives, when the thermometer gets up that high, in other words, that's how wicked people have gotten, he would have Israel inherit the land so that at the same time, they would smite the Amorites. And it was the Amorites, the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full, he said. Now, until then, they won't conquer Canaan and they won't drive out the inhabitants and destroy those enemies. It had to be at the right moment. Now, that all came to my spirit one day when I was praying and studying the Bible and it made me think of what God said about the salvation for mankind. Now, let's go back to Genesis 3. God is talking to the devil here, the serpent that caused Adam and Eve, tempted them to sin. He said, I'm going to put enmity between thee, you serpent, and the woman, Eve, and between thy seed and her seed. It is going to bruise your head and you're going to bruise his heel. Now get that picture. If a, if a head and heel are bruised at the same time, then someone's heel is crushing somebody's head. And though the heel might be bruised, that ain't anything compared to bruising the devil's head. And that's what the work, this was the first prophecy in the entire Bible of Jesus Christ coming to destroy the devil. And how did he do it? He did it through the cross. And I just want to throw this little picture in here. Do you remember when, what mountain Jesus was crucified on? Golgotha, Calvary. It's the same mountain. Golgotha comes from a different language than Calvary. And both of them mean the place of the skull. So, you know what I picture? I picture Jesus on that cross on a big, huge hill called the place of the skull. And when he dies, his feet are just above that place of the skull, that head. And it symbolizes destroying the head of the devil. I always like picturing it like that. Isn't that awesome? Now, why would God bring salvation to mankind at the same time, he's going to bruise the serpent's head. He said, I'm going to bring the woman. And, and her seed is going to bruise your head, devil. And Jesus actually means in English, God is my salvation. God was bringing salvation at the same time he's going to destroy the devil. See, he does this because he wants us to get salvation and bruise the devil's head so we can keep our salvation. That's why he was bringing Israel into the promised land that when the iniquity came to a maturity, they would break it and be able to hold on to that land. So time arrived in Israel, for Israel, in the land of Canaan rather, when the iniquity came to a fall. And that's why in Exodus 3 and 8, this is four generations from Abraham, just like God talked to him about in Genesis 15. I am come down, God says, to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians. And, and God told Abraham that they would be prisoners like this for four generations. So here he goes. I'm going to bring them up out of that land unto a good land and a large, unto a land flowing with milk and honey, unto the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites. And here it is, the Amorites. Now, he said the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. So Abraham, I'm going to wait until that iniquity gets there and then you're going in and you're going to crush them. And notice here they're mentioned at the time God's delivering Israel out of Egypt to go into the promised land. So they're mentioned. Now, if you go to Numbers 13 and 29, and this was all during the Exodus, written during the Exodus as well, 
The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, Numbers 13 and 29. And the Hittites, the Jebusites, here they are again, and the Amorites. They dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. And in chapter 21 and verse 21, Israel sent messengers unto Zion, king of the Amorites. Here they are again. This is this people that God had in mind way back in, in uh, Abraham's day, and he knew they were wickedness was going to get worse. Now, when this happened during the Exodus, Israel sent messengers to Sihon. The Amorites refused to let Israel pass through. And God tells Israel, you destroy them. Now, years later, they're in the land and they're conquering nations. And here we come to a place where Moses when they came into the land, died, and Joshua took over. And Joshua sends two witnesses similar to Revelation chapter 11, where you read about the two witnesses. And you Bible school students know what I'm talking about. If you don't know what I'm talking about, I don't have time right now to explain it, but it's just for those, it adds to the message, but it's not important for you to understand it for this message tonight. So these two witnesses... And then, that, that was when they conquered Jericho. Remember the two witnesses went and talked to Rahab the spy and she hid the two witnesses? Well, then he conquers Jericho and they distinctly march around the wall blowing seven trumpets of ram's horns. And that's just like the book of Revelation because you got seven trumpets being blown and destruction and walls, spiritually speaking, are coming down. Isn't that amazing? And God fights the battle. He's listening to Joshua. And in Joshua chapter 10, years after they conquer Jericho, another situation comes where they're battling. And God listens to Joshua when the sun and the moon stand still. And I'm going to show you that here in a moment. But notice that signs in the sun and the moon are also in prophecy. Just wanted to throw that in there. Now, in Joshua's day, just like Melchizedek was king of Salem, which later became Jerusalem in Abraham's day, in Joshua's day, there's a king of Jerusalem. Joshua 10 and 3. Wherefore, Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem. Now, pause right there for a moment. Melchizedek, and now you've got Adonai Zedek. Isn't it interesting? You got and, and according to ancient history, a Zedek was a leader of a city or, an, or a people. So Melchizedek was the king of Salem. Adonai Zedek is now the king of Jerusalem four generations later. And so this king sent unto Hohem, king of Hebron, and Hebron was another powerful people, in the promised land, and Piram, king of Jarmuth, there's another leader of another people, and Japhiah, king of Lachish, and Deber, king of Eglon, saying, come up unto me and help me, that we may smite Gibeon, for it has made peace with Joshua and the children of Israel. Therefore, the five kings of the Amorites, the king of Jerusalem, Hebron, Jarmuth, Lachish, Eglon, gathered themselves together and went up. They made a coalition. You see, Gibeah, Gibeon, one of the nations, one of the cities, made a peace with Israel so that they wouldn't be destroyed. And so these other kings said, look, we're going to be taken over. We don't want to be taken over. We don't want to make peace. So instead of each one of us facing Israel and losing, let's all of us band together and fight Israel. And it says they gathered themselves together, they went up in all their hosts and encamped before Gibeon and made war against it. So first, they destroy Gibeon. We don't need a bunch of... They looked at Gibeon as traitors because Gibeon had made allies with Israel. Now, Adonai Zedek in English means Lord of Righteousness. Now, that's not a good name for a man that's fighting the people of Israel in the Old Testament because those people of Israel were the people of God. And when this king of Jerusalem fought against Israel, the time for inheriting the land and smiting the Amorites had arrived. 
the iniquity of the Amorites had come to the full. That's why they were in Israel. Israel was there. They were in the promised land, rather. They were in Canaan because God told Abraham, I'm not getting them in to get the land until that iniquity rises to a certain level. And at that moment, at that time of history, when the iniquity was full, a man who called himself righteous was utterly wicked. And it all occurred at Jerusalem. Oh, wow, is this ever going to open up? Are you ever going to see a parallel in the New Testament here when you keep studying this out with me tonight? But what's Joshua hear from God in Joshua 10 and 8? This king of Jerusalem gets all of these nations together, five armies. Now remember, Abraham fought against four and he won. Now there's five coming against his descendants. And God says to Joshua, fear, not, fear them not. For I have delivered them into thy hand. There shall not a man of them stand before thee. And the Lord said unto Joshua in verse 8, Fear not. And then in Revelation 1 and 9, Revelation has so many parallels here. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation. So here they're going through battling. They're going through persecution. John is on an island called Patmos, which was a prison island. He says, I'm your companion in tribulation, in the kingdom and the patience of Jesus Christ. I was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus. And then down in verse 17, when I saw him, he sees Jesus. And when he sees Jesus, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me. And he sang unto me, fear not. I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth. I was dead, and behold, I'm alive forevermore. Amen, and I have the keys of hell and of death. Just like he told Joshua, fear not. Now, notice something about the keys of hell. In Matthew 16 and 18, do you remember when Jesus said to Peter, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it? In Revelation, the church is encouraged to pray down the persecution that was headed up by Jerusalem, by the works of the devil. You see, the devil threw everything he had into those religious leaders and used them to knock out Jesus and crucify him and then persecute the church. And John, one of the apostles, was, pat, uh, uh, was put onto an island called Patmos, as a prisoner because the church was undergoing tribulation and persecution. But it's like he said to Joshua, fear not. And he says to John, fear not. See the parallels here? The church is going to pray this thing down and I'm going to show you the scriptures where that happened. And so now let's compare Melchizedek to Adonai Zedek. Adonai Zedek was both king of Jerusalem and leader of the Amorite coalition against Israel with those five king's armies. Now, what happened to Melchizedek's godly reign in Jerusalem? He was king of Salem, which later became Jerusalem, and he blessed a man of God, Abraham. But Adonai Zedek is fighting the people of God, Abraham's descendants. His descendants, or rather Melchizedek's descendant, as the king and priest over Jerusalem is Adonai Zedek, a wicked king of the Amorites or a people whose sin were going to ripen when the promised land was going to be given to Israel. What on earth happened between Melchizedek and Adonai Zedek? He either assumed the title because he really wasn't a descendant of Melchizedek or he was a descendant, but he became evil. Either case, it doesn't matter. He fought the people of God and Joshua, whereas Melchizedek blessed Abraham, Joshua's ancestor. And the same thing happened when Jesus came. In Zechariah 9 and 9, Jesus was prophesied to come to Jerusalem. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He's just, having salvation lowly, and riding upon an ass, and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. 
In John 1 and 1, look what happened when he came, though. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. And in Matthew 21 and verse 8 to 9, in the triumphal entry, when Zechariah is being fulfilled, a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees. They were palm branches. Strawed them in the way. And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And Hosanna means, save us, O King. And they were recognizing Jesus as their king because Zechariah said, your king's coming to Jerusalem. And in Matthew 21 and 15, the same chapter, and when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did and the children crying in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were sore displeased. Just like things were great with God's people and Melchizedek, but four generations later, Adonai Zedek over Jerusalem wasn't happy, would not, in fact, fought Israel, fought Joshua. And by the way, guess what the Greek version of Joshua is? Jesus. Jesus in Hebrew is Joshua or Yeshua. And so just like Adonai Zedek was fighting Joshua, these chief priests and scribes were fighting the real Joshua, the greater Joshua, Jesus, in the same city, Jerusalem. And in Luke 19 and 38, when they said, Blessed be the king that cometh in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest, some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. And in John 19 and 15, but they cried out away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered and said, we have no king but Caesar. See the transition from godliness leading Israel in Jerusalem way back in Melchizedek's time and now ungodliness, just like Adonai Zedek was a corrupt leader like the Pharisees in Jesus' day. And in Mark 15 and 11, the chief priests moved the people that he should rather release Barabbas unto them when Pilate said, Get the worst one you can get because this Jesus shouldn't die. Get Barabbas, a murderer and, and a zealot. And they'd rather have a murderer than Jesus. You talk about the sin of the people coming to the fullness. And in Matthew 27 and 20, but the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask Barabbas and destroy Jesus. And the scribes and the Pharisees and the chief priests were leaders. They were called righteous. But they were wicked and fought against the true Joshua, Jesus Christ. They actually were the ones in the parable in Matthew 21 who tended the vineyard. And Jesus came to bring us into the kingdom. Oh my. In Matthew 21 and 33, look at the parable. There was a certain householder which planted a vineyard. He hedged it round about and digged a wine press in it. And built a tower and let it out to husbandmen and went into a far country. And in verse 38, when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and let us seize on his inheritance. Because servants were sent to get the fruit and they wanted to keep it and they beat them and killed some. And then when the Lord sent his son, they took him and seized the inheritance. That represents Jesus being taken and fought by the Pharisees and the religious leaders, the husbandmen of the vineyard called Jerusalem. And in Matthew 21 and 40, Jesus said, When the Lord of the vineyard cometh, what will he do to those husbandmen? And these people said unto him with their own mouths, He will miserably destroy those wicked men and let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen, which shall render him the fruits in their seasons. And in verse 43, Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, The kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. They perceived that he spoke of them in verse 45. And notice verse 40, it's talking about the Lord coming, the coming of the Lord. Folks, we're looking for the coming of the Lord in resurrection in our future. But that's not what the book of Matthew is talking about when it talks about the coming of the Lord. The only coming of the Lord the disciples knew at that point in time before Jesus went to the cross was a coming in destruction against Jerusalem. And that's why they asked in Matthew 24 and verse 3, what's the sign of your coming? 
And this, verses like this in chapter 21, before chapter 24, tells you where they got the concept of what they knew the coming of the Lord to be. It was a coming of destruction. That is the coming of Jesus in the first century. And it was to scribes and Pharisees, Jesus said in Matthew 23 and 31, he said, Wherefore you be witnesses unto yourselves that you're the children of them which killed the prophets. Fill you up then the measure of your fathers. What did he say to Abraham would be the point in time where God would be signaled to send the children of Israel in to conquer the land? When the iniquity of the Amorites came to a fullness. And here we read, Fill ye up then the measure of your fathers. Just like when Joshua went in fighting against Mel, uh, Melchizedek's descendant, Adonai Zedek, when Adonai Zedek should have been helping him. Similar to that, the iniquity of the Amorites had come to the full, and that's when Joshua went in. And Jesus came, the greater Joshua. At the time when the iniquity of these religious leaders over Jerusalem, just like Adonai Zedek was a religious leader over Jerusalem, but it was wicked, just when Jesus came and they fought him and they had filled up their iniquity to the brim. And Jesus even used the term, you fill up the measure of your fathers. You serpents, you generation of vipers, how can you escape the damnation of hell? Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them you shall kill and crucify. Jesus was talking about his own death and crucifixion including Peter, who was crucified upside down, and likely others. And he said, some of them shall you scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city. Notice, he said, crucify. Now, in Matthew 23 and 37, these were words addressed to Jerusalem, the very city where Adonai Zedek was ruling, the very city where his ancestor Melchizedek ruled righteously. O Jerusalem, Jesus cried, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathered her chickens under her wings, and you would not. And the same judgment noted to the Pharisees and scribes is noted to Jerusalem. He was talking to Pharisees and scribes earlier on, just before this verse. And then he addresses it all as Jerusalem. Iniquity, folks, came to a fall in the days of Joshua and Jesus. Look in Genesis 15 and 16. In the fourth generation, he told Abraham, they'll come hither again. Your people are going to come. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. And in Matthew 23 and 32, fill you up then the measure of your fathers, Jesus said to those hypocrites. And it involved Jerusalem in both cases. My, isn't the word of God powerful? How you see a message in Joshua's battle against the king of Jerusalem. Just like you see a battle with Jesus against these religious leaders of Jerusalem. And just like Adonai Zedek was wicked when he should have been helping Joshua, these religious leaders were wicked when they should have been helping Jesus. Now let's talk about inheriting the kingdom. Jesus was bringing us into the Holy Ghost realm of the kingdom of God. Remember John the Baptist said, I baptize with water, but Jesus is going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. And that would occur in the same generation when the church would smite the devil's work in the world through Jerusalem, just like Joshua came in with the nation of Israel to smite the iniquity of the Amorites and crush it. Hallelujah. But Jesus' day was a little different. The Amorites had iniquity that was ripening. And that tells us that God sees the morality of people into the future. He knows what they're going to be like spiritually way off into the future. And he spared these people until that iniquity came to a certain level. And then he knew it was time. He extinguished them as a nation in Joshua's day. But Jerusalem's iniquity in Jesus' day was associated with a strain that goes way back, long before Abraham, 
to the time of Abel's death, the very son of Adam and Eve. Talk about going back in time. You see, in Matthew 23 and 35, when he's talking to these Pharisees and hypocrites, he says, upon you is going to come all the righteous blood shed on the earth. And I'm going right back to the blood of Abel, from righteous Abel, unto the blood of Zacharias, the son of Berechiah, whom you slew between the temple and the altar. He's taken all of humanity into consideration here. That sweeps back more than just Jerusalem alone. He's getting a bit broader now with what Jesus was going to deal with. It takes in all of mankind's sins, not just Canaan's, not just the Amorites. This is going right back to the very first murder because they were going to murder Jesus. Back to the first people born after the fall of mankind. You see how it's a larger picture? He's got bigger fish to fry in Jesus' day all the sin of the human race and in matthew 23 and 37 when he said oh jerusalem jerusalem when he said thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee look what he says how often i would have gathered you your children together as a hen gathers her chickens under her wings and you would not beneath his wings is a very significant picture it reminds us of the blood that was sprinkled on the Ark of the Covenant, beneath the wings of the cherubim. This is where the blood was sprinkled every year in the temple and in the tabernacle when God would forgive the sins of Israel for a year. And all of Israel's sins were atoned for when the high priest went in and offered that blood. He said, I would have gathered you under my wings. In other words, I would have brought you into salvation. Oh, watch this. That's not all. He would have sheltered Jerusalem from the wrath that was due for all the sins of the earth. Are you grasping the depth of this now? It's going further here than maybe what we thought before. He's going right back to the murder of Abel. Talk about an atonement. Hallelujah. Beneath his wings. He's the real Ark of the Covenant in person. But instead, Jerusalem was going to reap the whirlwind of the sins of the earth instead. Iniquity of the world had come to a fullness, not just Israel. And by putting them beneath his wings, we're to understand he would have taken that judgment himself. If a hen is gathering her chicks under her wings, that means danger's coming and the hen is going to take the brunt of it to protect those children and Jesus was going to take the brunt of judgment to protect his children aren't you glad that you believed in Jesus and he took you under his wings and the the place on the ark of the covenant beneath his wings where the blood was sprinkled is called the mercy seat he brought you into a place of mercy and protected you from wrath hallelujah he would have taken the cup for Jerusalem is what he was saying Matthew 26 and 39, he went a little further. Remember the Garden of Gethsemane? And he fell on his face and he prayed saying, Oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And verse 42, he went away again the second time and prayed saying, Oh, my father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. Oh, hallelujah. He was willing to do that for Jerusalem. He hesitated. It was the guilt of everyone's sins. Jerusalem had filled a cup with similar guilt from all the earth's ages in the past. Iniquity in the earth had come to a fullness. And all the blood shed on the earth from Abel's death was filled to the brim by the generation of Jerusalem in the day of Jesus. Their acts were going to fill the cup up. When they crucified him, they were going to cross the line. And Jesus drank a cup of all the guiltiness of sins since Adam as well. His death on the cross would account for all the sins ever committed. He would have considered Jerusalem forgiven of their guilt if they had accepted him. He took all the sins of the world, folks. Jerusalem would be guilty of all the righteous blood shed from the beginning. And these two pictures are deeply connected here. 
God covered the blood with cherubim's wings, spiritually speaking. God always covered Israel where the blood was. What a beautiful picture. He'll cover you if you run to him, the blood of Jesus, and claim that blood, claim that death. That's what the bread and wine represents. That's where the blessing is, the breaking of his body and death and the shedding of his blood and death. Exodus 12 and 23, the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians. And remember when the blood was put around the doorway, when he sees the blood upon the lintel and on the two sides of the post, the Lord will pass over the door, will not suffer the destroyer to come into your houses to smite you. He'll protect you. He always covers where the blood is, just like on the mercy seat, just like in the doorways of Egypt. And Joshua's conquest of the king of Adonai Zedek of Jerusalem was just a foreshadow of his con Jesus's confrontation with Jerusalem's leaders, but it involved a state of the sin of all mankind. Oh, I just need to stop for a moment, folks. I need to praise my God. This is just so overwhelming. It's so blessed. It's so powerful. The truth of God's word, how it comes together like this. Isn't that awesome? Fake righteous Pharisees and scribes were leading Jerusalem and influencing those precious people. And in Joshua 10 and 22, go back. Then said Joshua, open the mouth of the cave and bring out those five kings to me out of the cave. You see, those kings had fled into a cave when they realized they were being defeated. And they did so and brought forth those five kings out of the cave. And the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Jarmuth, Lachish, and the king of Eglon. And it came to pass when they brought out those kings unto Joshua that Joshua called for all the men of Israel and said unto the captains of the men of war which went with him, Come near, put your feet upon the necks of these kings. And they came near and put their feet on the necks of them. Under your feet. In Joshua 10 and 24, it came to pass when they brought out those kings. He called for those men. Come near, put your feet on the necks of the kings. Look at Romans 16 and 20. Just a few short years before Jerusalem was going to be destroyed in A.D. 70. Paul said, the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. A reference to the A.D. 70 destruction of the enemies of the church. Shortly, at hand, quickly. Folks, this was going to happen shortly after John wrote about it in the book of Revelation. And the bulk of the doom and the wrath in Revelation was not going to happen thousands of years later in our future. It was going to happen shortly after John wrote of it because Revelation 1 and 1 says, these things shall shortly come to pass, John. And Revelation 1 and 3 says, these things are at hand, John. And he told them in Rome, Satan's going to be bruised under your feet shortly. You see that in Revelation 1 and 1 in verse 3. You see it in Revelation 22 and 6. Even chapter 2 and 5, 2 and 16, 3 and 11, 22 and 7, 10, 12, and verse 20. Put your feet upon the necks of these kings. Rome, Christians in Rome, God's going to bruise Satan under your feet shortly. And it all goes back to the first prophecy of Jesus in Genesis 3 and 15. I will put enmity between thee and the woman, you serpent, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And in Romans 16 and 20, Franklin Camp wrote this as a theologian and his scholar. Paul foresees the fall of Judaism and pictures it as the defeat of Satan. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. Judaism became Antichrist, according to John in the epistles of John. And remember, Antichrist in 1 John chapter 4 is a spirit that denies that Jesus came in the flesh. They were the Adonai Zedek of Christ's day. These people fighting Christ. He Adonai Zedek represented the spirit of Antichrist. Remember Abraham was blessed with bread and wine, which represented the body and the blood of Jesus. You didn't see anything with Adonai Zedek like you did with Melchizedek because that represented Jesus come in the flesh and the devil can't stand that, that prophecy. 
your head is going to be crushed by the seed of the woman. He tried to get that out of his mind. He didn't want to think of it. That's why the devil won't confess that Jesus came in the flesh. That's why the spirit of Antichrist won't confess it. Because by coming in the flesh, he would be the seed of the woman. And he knew the seed of the woman was going to crush his head. And he might try to stick his head in the sand like an ostrich and pretend it isn't going to happen by not thinking about it. But it did happen. And it came. And that's why the devil would never call Jesus the son of man. Man, he would only say, if thou be the son of God, turn this bread into stone. If thou be the son of God, he would never call Jesus the son of man. When he said, rather, turn this stone into bread and so forth. Joshua 10 and 26. Afterward, Joshua smote them and slew them and hanged them on five trees. And they were hanging upon the trees until the evening. Did you know something about hanging in the Old Testament? It wasn't with a noose. It was called gibbeting. And gibbeting is similar to the cross. Hanging on trees, always in the Bible, spoke of the cross. It's a foreshadow. Remember I told you to look for the bread and the wine? Remember I told you to look at uh, Melchizedek was king and priest and Jesus is king and priest? Remember resurrection of Abraham and Jesus' resurrection? Here's another one. A cross. Apply the work of the cross to your enemy. Hang them on a tree. Because folks, Jesus Christ through the cross gave you victory. And when you claim your victory from the cross because you're a Christian and you believe in Jesus and your life is his, then you by that cross have power over the devil. And that's how a picture of the cross killing these kings represents you use your God-given power because of the cross of Jesus Christ and by the blood of Jesus. That's what you're saying when you say, I claim the blood. You're claiming what Jesus did on the cross to make you what you are. And you've got the name of Jesus on your side and you can conquer him, even Satan himself. Apply the work of the cross to the enemy. Adam Clark said, this was the debt required by justice. Then they were hanged up, perhaps generally by the hands, not by the neck. That's what hanging means in the Bible. It's translated the gallows in some instances. So when you see gallows, don't think of a noose. Think of them hung up by their hands like Jesus. And you're going to get a hint about some kind of message, how God will help you destroy your enemies. He died on the cross, Jesus did. So we could be free from sin and the power of the devil. And we've got to use that place of power through the cross, acknowledging that that's why we've got the power, through the blood, against our enemies. And Revelation tells us that the church was going to be responsible for victory over the devil. Hallelujah. Oh, praise God. You know, I'm going to have to stop there and I'm going to have to continue this again next time. But oh my, oh my, folks, aren't you glad that Jesus Christ is King of kings and Lord of lords and you are his child and you're a child of Abraham and just like, oh my, the Lord's showing me some more, just like the descendants or the children of Abraham were going to come into the land and conquer Adonai Zedek when the iniquity of the Amorites would come to a fall, we are the children of Abraham too and we're coming in to conquer the devil, hallelujah. If you see iniquity arising in the land, don't sit back and just twiddle your thumbs for Jesus to come. Use your power, drive out that wickedness, and pray it down. People, I saw a preacher just the other day on the internet preaching a powerful message that the cultural defeat of the Western church in North America and Europe is all because of this crazy, insane belief that this evil has to happen. They're misinterpreting revelation and they're putting all of that in our future and saying it's got to happen because it's prophesied. So just sit back and let the devil take over. And that's not what the Bible taught. It was talking about the first century when the power of the church prayed that devil down and crushed the head of Satan like Paul told the Romans they were going to do very shortly. And church, this idea that we just let sin take over because it's prophesied came from dispensationalism. And that, 
false idea and belief needs to be cast out and we need to enforce our minds with the truth that we've got the blood of Jesus Christ on our side we've got the power of his name hallelujah and bring down that power of the devil bring down wickedness in our day don't sit back and let it happen I believe that's why our culture and society in North America has gone to the dogs because the church accepted this belief around the beginning of the 1900s. And most churches preach it to this day. Oh, church, we got a prayer meeting on our hands that we need to pray. We need to pray God open people's eyes and get this church back on its knees and claiming the power of God to tear down because the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. Hallelujah, God. <laughs>